Holy yikes. Josiah, it is. what's going on here, man? <laughs> Listen, it's some sort of strange love triangle, right? <laughs> the, the, you have two prominent MAGA cultists fighting over the same man. It's a classic 90s rom-com situation, just like set instead of in a high school, in a cult with a bunch of like, you know, racists and bigots and authoritarians. So it's like an authoritarian 1990s rom-com where Marjorie Taylor Green, Mar Marjorie Taylor Green is the reasonable figure in this arrangement. She is very upset that uh, Donald Trump is uh, flirting politically or perhaps otherwise with Laura Loomer, um, who is perhaps the only MAGA cultist who would make somebody like Marjorie Taylor Greene look kind of chill. So for context, Laura Loomer, who is not a Republican congressperson, she ran for office and lost badly. Um, she is a MAGA influencer and she's very devoted to Donald Trump. And she is also a bigot. She says incendiary things all the time. The vice president posts um, a thing on Twitter celebrating National Grandparents Day, and she talks about her uh, South Asian uh, grandparents. And then Laura Loomer responds with this like really unhinged racist screed talking about if uh, Kamala wins the presidency, the White House is going to smell like curry and everybody's going to speak like they're, you know, giving tech support and things like that. And Marjorie Taylor Greene came out of nowhere and was like, you know, that's pretty racist and fucked up. And again, just like knowing all the anti-Semitic and bigoted things that Marjorie Taylor Greene has said is kind of like the pot calling the kettle black. But then this triggered a whole meltdown in MAGA world. I don't think that she uh, has the experience or, or the right mentality to advise a very important person. Why do you think the former president I guess you is even listening to her? She's getting bad advice, or he's getting bad advice from us. Uh, I'm not involved in their conversation, so I can't weigh in on that. Uh, but I do know this, that her rhetoric and her tone is, is does not match the base, does not match MAGA, does not match most Republicans I know. And I, I'm completely denouncing it. I'm over it. And I would encourage anyone else that matches her statements to stop. The thing is that Trump's doubled down on it. Like, Trump was asked about this during a press conference or a campaign event in uh, California yesterday, and he was asked about it repeatedly by multiple reporters. And he's like, listen, Laura Loomer, she's uh, she's a free spirit and uh, and she's really devoted. Laura is a supporter. Uh, I don't control Laura. Laura has to say what she wants. She's a she's a free spirit. And so he just like doubled down on his association with Loomer, even though multiple Republicans, not just Green, are coming out of the woodwork and just begging him, please, for the love of God, let her go. He won't, man. He yeah, won't. I feel like Loomer is one of those uh, lurking, lurking, uh, really a prominent, I would say, conservative voice on X that tweets some of the craziest things that are on that platform, a consistent source of misinformation, disinformation, racist, hateful, just terrible things. But I mean, at least you could just say they were, you know, just random people on Twitter, just random people on X. But the fact that Trump seems to be dating her now, do you have an opinion on this? I mean, Donald Trump is well known, Stephen. I don't know what you're talking about, but he's well known as a man who uh, really respects and honors his marriage vows and uh, not at all a philanderer, would never stray from Melania, who clearly loves him and enjoys his company. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't be stunned. I wouldn't be shocked at all. Um, Donald Trump, in all seriousness, of course, is uh, a, a serial cheater, philanderer. Um, I wouldn't put it past him at all, because here's the thing, you know, set his libido aside the thing that drives donald trump more than anything at 78 years old is this this unconditional devotion to him and i think in this election cycle he's seeing you know even people like marjorie taylor green sometimes defy him it's happened a couple of times as a matter of fact with um her her feud with speaker mike johnson laura loomer uh is that sort of person who is like come hell or high water at least so far She's got Trump's back, and I think that that is arousing to Trump in ways that nothing else is. So I wouldn't be stunned or surprised at all if they had some sort of relationship. Um, There's a lot of like videos and pictures of them like pretty close together. I know Laura Loomer posted that video of him <laughs> blowing her a kiss from the I think the debate stage <laughs> afterwards. I love you.
Bro, yes. Yeah. I mean, and she's yeah. flying on Air Trump Force, Force One. one yeah. And she's been on to Mar-a-Lago a gazillion times. And we never see Melania anymore. Um, so, well, we did see her on X post that little video of her upcoming book with the uh, stock image of a book and then the default text Melania over the cover. That's true. And she did release a, a video, uh, you know, talking about um, it was kind of like in defense of Trump, but it was so stone cold. Like you could tell like she was reading it like mm -hmm. under duress. Like if the camera panned back, there was probably someone holding a gun to her. You know what I'm like? Just like say the words, Melania. But did you see the um, first video that she put out promoting the book? No, I don't think so. I, the, you know, looking at that second one, I agree that it came off a little bit more defensive of Trump. I wonder if that's because when I saw the first video, I almost wondered if it was like she was going to be writing a tell all, you know, on the end of a divorce or something, because there were I don't believe there were any mentions of Trump at all. I don't even know if there was a photo or any shared video of them. There might have been with the, her like standing next to him. But I the vibe that I got was, oh, my God, she's about to come and roast Trump with this book. This is going to be insane. So I wonder if that second video was to just kind of assuage the fear that she was well, even some drop tell all. Yeah. Well, even the second video, when I mean like she was defending Trump, it was like all on paper. Like, you know, she did. She does not speak about Trump in a way that somebody who loves their spouse would. And understandably so. If you've met Trump, I imagine he's pretty hard to love. So I, I, I want to be clear. I don't think she I don't think she's trying to overcompensate or whatever. I think anytime she goes out in defense of Donald, like if she shows up at the RNC or whatever, I think it's under duress. I think it is to satisfy terms of a contract. I think if she there's literally she'd probably be anywhere else on earth if she could. Um, but yeah, like all these pieces coming together, it does suggest something um, horrid. Um, but even if not, it's just really stupid politically. I mean, Donald Trump seems to be under the impression, I know you, because you debate a lot of MAGA cultists, they seriously believe that Trump is much more popular than what he is mm -hmm. and that he has a margin for error. He simply doesn't. Donald Trump's base is galvanized. They're motivated. There's very little deviation. He's always hovering like at like 43 percent uh, support, but he has never been popular. He's never cracked, never, not once, 50% approval rating, and that even after he got shot. Uh, mm -hmm. So this idea that he can just gallivant around with whomever he wants, and there will be no political consequences is just ridiculous. And so I don't know, I, I genuinely think he is spiraling in a way we've never seen from him before, and we've seen some pretty crazy shit from Trump. Yeah, the Keys guy, Alan Lichtman, um, mm -hmm. I, I know, I think I saw Tim Pool and a couple other conservative commentators get upset when he said that uh, Donald Trump couldn't turn the charisma key because some MAGA people are like, what, what do you mean? He, everybody loves Trump, but you're absolutely right. It is not true that everybody loves Trump. Republicans really love Trump. People that like Trump really like Trump, but Trump is absolutely not popular with the other side, the same way that other charismatic presidents might have been, even if they were, you know, only belonging to one political party. Uh, I do wonder, like you said, how much can Trump bear, even with his most galvanized fans? I mean, flying around and kind of sort of dating slash cheating on his wife with a 31 year old is kind of strange. It also makes me wonder, I think we have deep political questions for the United States. I don't actually know the answer to this. In the Constitution, is the first lady the person who's lawfully wed to the president or is it just the person who's currently dating? Let's assume that Trump hasn't divorced Melania. Let's assume that he is dating Laura Loomer. Who becomes the first lady at that point? So it's interesting. So my understanding is that the you know the first lady of the United States, which by the way isn't even referenced in the Constitution, it's just oh, a ceremonial oh, role. Okay, yeah, what do I know? Yeah, no. so it's just it's just the spouse of if the if the president is married, the spouse is the first lady or the first gentleman. Now, Governor Gavin, uh, you got to think about it. So, like states, they have their own mini presidents, governors, and governors have spouses and partners. And so, for example, Governor Gavin Newsom is unmarried. He's got he's dating a woman, and she is the first partner of California. So it's whoever the significant other of the chief executive is in the absence of a marriage. But if there have been unmarried presidents, and I'm sure there have, I don't remember who the hell they are. So, like, it's just part of that tradition. But, yeah, that, isn't that terrifying to think that there could be a divorce and then there could be a first partner, Laura Loomer, you know, God, can you imagine, like, the White House? Uh, I mean, I like, can think of way parties. more scary things, and those include appointments to attorney general for the DOJ and stuff like that. So, but, yeah, Laura Loomer is pretty terrifying, and I do agree.
she could have a position in the White House. I mean, we talked about this before. Like, I mean, maybe not the DOJ specifically, but like she could be press secretary. She could be communications That's director. True. She could be senior advisor. She could she could be White House chief of staff. We talked about that role. It's so fascinating. It's effectively the second most powerful role in the federal government requires no, it's listed nowhere in the Constitution, requires no Senate confirmation. You don't even have to make them acting chief of staff because it's not like you have to work around the Senate. You could have a chief of staff, Laura Loomer. I'll also say, while you were talking, it occurred to me, Luke Beasley interviewed Laura Loomer, and I'm just thinking to myself, if Luke could, has interviewed someone that crazy, I feel like you should interview her. I feel like that would be such a good conversation. You know she'd do it. If you reach out to Laura Loomer, she'd have that conversation. Would you interview... Stephen Bunnell, you know what? Did you interview Laura Loomer? DM it in the past. I'll sh I can shoot her a DM today, but I feel like after the last performance with Trump and with all the news media coverage, I'm sure there's like a trillion people that are now barking of that tree trying to interview. But I will shoot her a DM just for you. You so, should. And if it you happens, should. you can have full credit for it. Okay. I appreciate that. Would she be the craziest person that you've ever talked to or no? Not even close. Oh, damn. Which says something. That's here. It yeah. says something about our it says something about our planet, but yes, it does. Big stories for the the week. Obviously, what's going on in Springfield, Ohio? I, I don't even know if that, in and of itself, you know, the the influx of of migrants to uh, Springfield, Ohio, would necessarily be national news, except for the fact that Donald Trump made it national news because he's spreading this conspiracy theory that uh, Haitian migrants are eating the cats, and the dogs. And uh, obviously it's bullshit. There's no evidence for it. Uh, he was fact-checked on it, but he will not let it die. And as a consequence of this, stunner when uh, a former president of the United States, potentially the future president of the United States and leader of one of two major political parties talks about this stuff, um, there are ripple effects. And as a consequence, there have been an influx of bomb threats to public buildings, including schools. Schools had to be, you know, they, they, there's reports that uh, not only the FBI on site, but um, that students in public schools in Springfield had to be taken into the gym to, be, to discuss bomb threats. And uh, uh, there were school cancellations as well. I'm um, sorry, all I can hear over and over and over again is my argument with Piers where he's telling me how irresponsible it was for Biden to say bullseye <laughs> to right. uh, donors in the meeting because it was such inflammatory rhetoric. So. Yeah, the um, I think I, I saw the, um, I don't know if you posted it or but I saw that the two schools had been, I think, canceled for the day because of incoming bomb threats. And yeah, having a former president saying that Haitians are eating, you know, en masse animals off the street, which I believe up to this point, I don't think there has been a single shred no. of evidence for. Uh, it, it's pretty terrifying how quickly these stories spread from nothing and then how quickly they recede into the background and how little of a lesson anybody actually learns from them. This is, uh, this is Donald Trump's kitty litter boxes in school moment, right? The Joe Rogan thing. Yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's crazy and stupid. I hate that nobody suffers any credibility hit for just spreading absolutely and utterly baseless stories. Do you know if there's any truth to the idea that they started with a guy who was essentially a neo-Nazi giving a, you know, an impassioned speech in front of the city council? I, I had heard that. Um, there is some credible reporting about that, but there was also credible reporting that another source of the rumor was a woman who made a post on Facebook about a neighbor's cat being eaten by a Haitian migrant. And that story had been told to the neighbor who owned the cat third party. So it's like it's like this weird chain of custody as far as like the story goes. They interviewed the woman who put up the Facebook story. She deleted the post. She is uh, emotional. She's upset. She goes, it was not my intent to demonize Haitian people, whatever. This was just a rumor in the neighborhood that I was told. So I just talked about it on social media. She said people have gone wild with it. They're demonizing Haitians. It's led to bomb threats and mass panic. And I disavow the whole thing. I'm so sorry. I, I deleted the post. So I feel like this is one of those stories where it's going to be really hard to trace the single origin point of it sounds like it's one of those things where it's like there are multiple, you know, contemporaneous mm -hmm. um, conspiracy theories popping up. But yeah, I did hear that about the uh, about the neo Nazi giving speech and 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 you know going back to to me, what is the broader issue besides demonizing uh, immigrants is the lack of consequences and just the asymmetry. This is something that on my content, my channel, I talk about a lot because I do think it. 
it's me- it's not necessarily the immediate problem, but it represents a long term problem with the political structure in our country, kind of like the Supreme Court, which is the last story that I want to bring to your attention. But we can't have a system. We can't have a truly functioning system where we evaluate two candidates, two sides, two political parties, two movements by different standards. Like my call to conservatives and centrists when I have conversations with them privately or publicly is pick a fucking standard, pick one standard. We can disagree on what the standard is. I might think your standard is too loose or too strict, but pick one and hold both sides to it. And what always happens going back to your many conversations with peers is the left and Democrats are responsible not only for their rhetoric and the rhetoric of their fringe, but also in some ways, even conservative rhetoric. Like it's actually Joe Biden's fault that Donald Trump has said these unhinged things because perhaps if we didn't bully Donald Trump as much as apparently we have, he wouldn't be tempted to say this radical shit. And I've started to, when I'm arguing with people on stream, I've started to reframe some things where people are saying, um, oh God, I wish I could remember it exactly, but it'll be like, uh, th- there'll be some huge issue, may- maybe with the, you know, the Haitian immigrants or, uh, oh no, no, it-, it had to do with the security of the election. And, I, you know, I was arguing with the guys, like, you know, there was no evidence. And it's like, yeah, but people, people have this feeling that it wasn't secure. No, that's not a real feeling that you have. That was something that was given to you by the conservatives. Like, okay, yeah, but you don't understand. Like, we saw these things. Did you did you like go there and look? No, you were shown it on media. Um, people will have these feelings that develop not randomly, but because conservatives are feeding them a type of news, and then they'll go to Democrats and they'll demand an answer for it. Like, you need to prove. It took me so long arguing with this guy who was saying, "How did it take a bar only two weeks to clear all the election fraud out of the DOJ? How could he even investigate it in two weeks?" There was nothing to investigate. There was nothing to work off. It's like, yeah, but still, like, how could he secure that? How could he know? Know what? There, there was nothing to know about. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. But yeah, it's, it's this, if you want to have high standards, I think that's probably a good thing. If you sure. want to have low standards, I'm a disgusting degenerate from the internet. Sure, we can do that. We can never have different standards, though. There is a uniquely evil, horrible, destructive thing about the political discourse when there are two completely different standards for how the candidates have to operate. And that drives me crazy. Yeah, it's gonna, it's, it's, it is a long-term threat to any sort of political cohesion, set aside principal disagreements. Like We can't even have those or litigate those if we have wildly different standards based on um, who happens to be you know, president or what's politically convenient. I mean, you go to the Watergate example because Republican President Richard Nixon was kind of the the poster child for political corruption before Donald Trump. And you look at how Republicans handled that. They were obviously biased towards Nixon, but it was Republicans who went to President Nixon and said, hey, listen, you need to resign by tomorrow because if you don't, Democrats will have the votes to impeach you and they're going to have enough votes from us Republicans to convict you in the Senate. So you what a go wild. out on your ass. This way. Right. That would never happen now. It would I, never imagine happen now. after Biden's debate performance. Right. The whole liberal media establishment, you know, couldn't talk about anything else for a week. And then every key Democrat in any key position of power behind the scenes is applying a huge amount of pressure on Biden and then making that pressure essentially known through through leaks and disclosures, right, basically, yeah, to the media. Can you imagine any debate performance ever that Donald Trump could have where Republicans would be like, I don't know about this guy, yeah. No, and that's why I'm not convinced that if he loses this election, I'm still not convinced that there's going to be a grand (laughs) epiphany because Trump, the Trump alphabet, I say, is 25 L's and one W. He won once in 2016, and it's just been a string of defeats electorally ever since, ever be, ever since he became the leader of the party. I think that as long as he's alive and as long as he chooses to exercise some you know, activity within politics, they're screwed. I think they have to wait until he passes away or until like if he loses this next election and he says, you know what, f- it, I'm done. I'm going to go the way of President Bush and just go down to Texas and finger paint, which is all George Bush does now. If he does that, then I think the Republicans will have room to emancipate themselves from him. But otherwise, no, I think this is it until he finally passes away. The last thing I'll say on this is, you know, you use the example of the, the 2020 election, election theft claims about how they create the atmosphere of election denialism, and then they appeal to it when arguing with Democrats, like, hey, listen, there has to be something here, there's potentially something here, otherwise people wouldn't feel this way. And it kind of reminds me, like, in 2016, if you look at the polls, a lot of Democrats felt that the election was stolen uh, by Trump uh, and Russia. Now, I would argue that's not because Democrats were, were arguing that, it's not like Hillary Clinton was coming out and saying that, it was because Trump was 
publicly inviting Russia to meddle in our elections, right? But the point is, is this. By that standard, the Democrats should have demanded that we audit the election, that we contest the election, that Hillary should have tried to sue her way into the White House, that we should have had recounts, we should have tossed it back to uh, the, the House of Representatives, we should have had alternate slate of electors. Like, by that same standard, Hillary Clinton had every right to do everything Donald Trump did in 2020 and 2016 because, well, people had doubts about the election. The problem is these MAGA cultists are so unprincipled. They're such losers. It's like, no, 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 that doesn't count. You don't get to question the 2016 election. Donald Trump was the duly elected president. No doubts about it whatsoever. Fuck your feelings. It doesn't matter if you doubted it. But in 2020, well, it's different. And I, that's where the, to me, when you have conversations with people who doubt the election, I think it's important to say, did you doubt the 2016 election? Do you wish we could have gone back and audited that election? Will you commit today that if any Democrat has doubts about the 2024 election in the event Trump wins, that you will commit to audits and recounts and alternate slates of electors and all that shit? And if the answer, of course, is no, because they're just authoritarians who want their cultists to win. Yeah, so. and that runs deep. I'm pretty sure um, Mark Short, who was legal counsel for Pence, I think testified in front of the J6 committee that um, that Eastman, you know, he asked Eastman, who gave up, uh, he was one of the people that was in, in charge of that that kind of plan to basically toss the election. Uh, and I think he asked Eastman, do you think that uh, Gore should have done this in, in 2000? Would you, have, or, or wait, Kerry, Gore? Yeah, no, it's Gore. Gore. It was yeah. Gore. Do you think yeah. Gore should have, and, I, and Eastman says, no, of course not. And then I think he asked in uh, 2016, do you think that the Democrats should have explored this with, with Biden in 2016? I, and he said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> it's like, right, so it's like all that matters as long as they have a little R next to their name. I mean, it's so, I, I, I have such contempt for it, and I know, I know you do too.